Now, if you'll turn, please, with me to the book of the Revelation, chapter 3 and verse number 14. Revelation chapter 3, I'm beginning to read at verse number 14. And we're moving this morning into the Lord's letter to Laodicea. And this is our final church. So Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. And remember now we've reached the final church. This is the seventh letter that the Lord Jesus writes to these churches. And so as we come to this final letter, we not only have the full mind of Christ to the assemblies in John's day, but we now have the full mind of Christ to every assembly that has come into be from the writing of these letters right through to the coming of the Lord. So Revelation chapter 3, beginning to read at verse number 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea. And remember again that angel. We haven't touched on the angel since we looked at it when we first came to Ephesus. But remember John's not writing to a bright shining angel. That word angel can be translated a messenger. And so John's writing to the man who is responsible of the assembly. And it'll be the man who is responsible in bringing the teaching of God's word to the assembly. Who will be the one who will deliver these letters to that particular assembly. So, and on to the angel of the church of Laodiceans, right? These things saith the Amen. The faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. So I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thyself, that thou mayest see. As many as I love... I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And if you just read, I'll just read chapter 4 and verse number 1, because this will end the period of church history. John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. There has never been a door opened in heaven before. And the first voice, remember the first voice he heard when we looked at it in Revelation chapter 1? The first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be here after. And so Revelation chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 22 will show us the things which must be here after. We know the Lord will bless the reading of his word, and we see the John there hearing the voice of the trumpet. And we know one day very soon, we too are going to hear a voice as of a trumpet, and it will be the Lord taking the church out to be with himself forevermore. And we know the Lord will bless the reading of his word for his name's sake. Now remember we pointed out that seven is the number of completion, and not as it has been usually said, the number of perfection. So now seven is the number of completion. And by the time we have finished looking at this last letter, 
the Lord's letter to Laodicea. We will not only have the complete picture of church history, but we will have the complete revelation of Christ to the churches. So if you were to say to me, brother, is there anything else that the Lord Jesus would have to say to the church in this age or in any other age that has passed? Well, I would have to say, no, there isn't. Because if there was, the Lord Jesus would have put them in these seven letters. So as we finish these seven letters and as we get them all out before us, we have the full and complete picture of church history and the full revelation of the mind of Christ to the church. And so over these past months, prophetically, we have been on a journey. And this journey has taken us over 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years of church history. From the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, right through to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, the rapture of the church. How long would it take you to read through from Acts 2 to Revelation chapter 4? Maybe a good couple of hours. But when you read through all those chapters, just keep in your mind that you're passing over 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years of church history. And they have been detailed and outlined for us in these seven churches. So remember when we looked at Ephesus? Ephesus covered the first 100 years of church history in post-apostolic days. And then when we came to Smyrna, Smyrna covered the next 200 years of church history. And we saw how those 200 years were 200 years of persecution and of tribulation from the Roman government, from Roman emperors. And then when we moved into Pergamos, we saw that it was the next 300 years of church history. And we saw how it was a marriage that God was against. The church and the state coming together. And we saw those 300 years of things being brought into the church that never should have been there under the ruler and the dictatorship of that emperor called Constantine. And then when we came to the next church, the church at Thyatira, we saw that it covered 900 long years, 900 dark years, where the darkness of Roman Catholicism ruled and the word of God was kept from the people. But following the darkness of Rome came the deadness of Protestantism. And for 250 years, we saw dead Protestantism and all that that brought. And then when we came to Philadelphia, there was 150 years of revival and 150 years of blessing. And the Lord really moved in those days. And we don't have to look back too far into church history to see all the great men and women that the Lord used in those days of revival. But now we've come to the church of Laodicea. And the church of Laodicea describes the period that we are living in today. We're right up to date. And the next great event to happen is the church is to go out. The Lord will come to the air. And as we read down through this letter, the Lord's letter to Laodicea, we find it is characterized as a period of lukewarmness, as a period of cooling down. Because some commentators would believe that the mixture of Sardis and the mixture of Philadelphia, Philadelphia who was blazing hot for God, and Sardis who was stone cold dead, when they mixed together, it produced the Laodicean period. When cold and hot is mixed together, what do you get? You get lukewarmness. And so out of these last two assemblies comes the lukewarmness of Laodicea, a cooling down, compromise and indifference. And sadly, that is what the period in which we are living in today is characterized as. Lukewarmness. Compromise. Indifference to the word of God. Now you remember when we looked at one of the studies on the Lord's Day morning, we talked about the different dispensations of time. And the dispensations of time is really God's plan for the ages. From the very beginning of creation, right through to the end of time, to the eternal state, God has split up time into certain dispensations. 
Now, what was the defining feature of every dispensation of time? It always ended in failure. So if we were to go back again to the book of Genesis, and we were to look at the dispensation of innocence, Adam and Eve, how did it end? It ended with Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden. It ended in failure. And so God could no longer deal with Adam and Eve in innocence. He was now dealing with them according to their conscience. And so the dispensation of conscience ushered in. How did the age of conscience end? God sent a worldwide flood. He saw that men who were governed by their conscience, their imaginations and the evil thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. Man couldn't govern himself according to his conscience. And so that dispensation ended in failure. It ended in a worldwide flood. But then if we were to move to the age of human government, after the great flood, God put the governments of the world into the hands of men. And what did men do? They built a tower. A tower and dedicated it unto the heavens. And as Romans chapter 1 says, they turned from worshipping the creator to worshipping the creature. And you remember that period ended in failure because God had to destroy the tower of Babel. He had to confuse their languages. And he had to scatter the people into the four corners of the world. But then that brings us on to the age of promise. And you remember how the age of promise ended? God had said to Abraham, I will give you a seed as numerous as the stars of the heaven and as many as the sands of the sea. And that seed that God had given to Abraham, where did it end up? In Egyptian bondage. And for 430 years, God's people went under Egyptian bondage. But then when God's people came out of the land, and God's people redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, and we come to Acts chapter 20, God gives to the nation of Israel the law. And now ushers in the dispensation of the law a long period of time, almost 2,000 years as well. When did the law end? When Christ died on the cross, said it's finished. And what did the nation of Israel do to their Messiah? They put him on a cross. And they said, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so the dispensation of the law came to an end. And when the Lord Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sent down the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, the day of grace began. But how is the day of grace going to end? It's going to end in lukewarmness. It's going to end in compromise. And because of this, the Lord Jesus will have to come and he will have to take the church of Jesus Christ out via the rapture. Do you know the rapture of the church will be a glorious event? It will. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the day when the Lord Jesus gives a great shout. There's a sound of a trumpet in the sky and the saints rise to meet the Lord in the air. But I want you to keep this in your mind, children of God, that it is the judgment of God upon a world. It is the judgment of God upon the church for failing to do what she was called to do, taking the gospel into all corners of the world. And holding fast to the word of God. And so sadly, as we come to this last period, the period of Laodicea, we are now coming to the period that best describes the days we are living in now. And you would know that this period of time we are in, and you will have heard it being preached from this pulpit more than once, we are living in the days of the Laodicean period. Now let me say something with regards to the name, Laodicea. Because this will give us a bit of a background and understanding as to what this letter is about. If you were to take the word Laodicea and you were to divide it into two, just as we have been doing with most of the names that we've had, Leo and Dicea. Well, Leo just simply means people. And Dicea means rights. And so you could say that this church, the church in Laodicea, is best described as the right people or people's rights. But if we were to take, first of all, and I want to just look at both of these meanings because they both can fit this church very well. But if we were to take, first of all, this little phrase, the right people, 
You know, this would be a good description that would apply to this church. Because as we read down through this letter, and if you were to take the time and do it in your own time, to gather up all the things that the Lord Jesus is saying concerning this church, we will find that they prided themselves in financial and in material prosperity. This was the assembly. And really, this was not only a characteristic of the church in Laodicea, but it was also characteristic of the city. Because history tells us that this city was destroyed more than once. And rather than receiving money and help from Rome, the Roman Empire, they said to the Roman Empire, they ripped them out a letter, and they said, we are rich and increased with goods, we have need of nothing. We will see to it, we will single-handedly build this city back to its former glory. They wouldn't accept any help. And so it can not only apply to the assembly, but it applies to the city. But we're not too worried about the city. We're only really concerned about the assembly. And so this assembly prided themselves in financial prosperity. Any issues, any problems that they might face, money was always the answer. And so they had reached a place in their lives, this assembly, where they had become so self-sufficient that they were no longer relying on the Lord Jesus for every blessing that they would need. They had become so dependent on self that they no longer relied upon the Lord. And you know, brothers and sisters, we're living in days where we have all that we need financially and materially. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with having money because there's not. But what I am saying is this. Have we got to a place in our lives where we are so depending on ourselves that we have become so self-sufficient looking after our own needs that we no longer depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ? And so there's this idea in Christendom today that we are the right people. We have need of nothing. And if we have all that we need financially and we have all that we need materially, the Lord must be blessing the labor of our hands. And that can be true. But we're going to see when the Lord Jesus writes to this assembly in Laodicea that it's not always the case. And every time I read down through this letter, the Lord's letter to Laodicea, I can't help but think of the story of the Christian missionary, the Chinese missionary who went to America. And he went to America for a few weeks or months or whatever time it was, and he had a great time. And when he came home, the brethren said to him, Brother, what is the one thing that amazed you most about the Christian church in the U.S.? And it could apply to the church over here as well in Northern Ireland. He says, one thing that amazed me most about the church in the U.S. is this. Is all they were able to accomplish with money. Without depending on the Lord. That was a good observation. And so the Lord is really getting down to the heart of this assembly. You remember when we looked at Smyrna. Smyrna lamented because all they had was tribulation and poverty. We looked at those two words. It was pressure and beggarliness. That's all Smyrna had. They had absolutely nothing. But what did the Lord Jesus say to them? He says, your perception of yourself is beggarliness and pressure and poverty. Do you want to know what my conception of you is? But thou art rich. You might be poor materially. But the Lord said, spiritually, you're absolutely rich. But if you take a look at Laodicea, what was Laodicea's boast? It's verse number number 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And the Lord Jesus with those eyes that are as a flame of fire just pierces in and gives the true evaluation of the assembly. But thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You have all that you need materially and financially. 
but spiritually you're a pauper. If I could ask you this morning, brethren and sisters in the assembly, which assembly would you like to be? Would you like to have everything financially and spiritually be poor? Or would you like to have everything spiritually, even though you mightn't have too much to your name? And don't be thinking this morning that I am only getting at the believers in the world that have a few pounds in the bank because I'm not. I want to make that clear. Because whether we're high up the social ladder of wealth, or we're maybe down a little bit lower with not as much, we're all living in a world of prosperity and in a world of plenty. And as far as I'm aware, I visited most of, people, most of the people in the assembly now, and I haven't seen too many of us living on the bread line. We all live in a world of blessing, a world of prosperity, a world of plenty. Could that be the reason why maybe we're not depending on the Lord the way we should? Could that be the reason why this period is defined as being lukewarm? At ease? Comfortable with things that are happening within and comfortable with things that are going on without? And we're no longer gazing upon the Lord the way we should. So you can see there's this boast in Christendom today. We are the right people. We have absolutely need of nothing. But then I not only want to take the meaning the right people, but I want to take the meaning people's rights. And you can see how this would describe the assembly too, but it would also be a good description of where we are in the world today prophetically. Because there has been more said over this past 50 years concerning people's rights than in any other generation that has gone before. We hear in the news about women's rights. We hear in the news about men's rights. We're now hearing in the news about marriage rights. And now in our day, we're hearing about gender rights. And I was reading in the Christian Institute there the other night on my wife's phone. And they have said that it will be passed, it is already passed, that before every child leaves primary school, they will have been given teaching concerning gender neutrality. Primary school. Brothers and sisters, if this isn't pointing us to the coming of the Lord, very, very soon. I don't know what is. And you will see, and you will be able to see, if you have any foresight at all, the confusion that that will have upon the minds of poor, innocent children. Do you know it's not their fault? And if we think the rise of teenage suicide is over and beyond what we could ever imagine today, you give it two or three years when these things are starting to be infiltrated into the minds of young children. And the thing about it is this, is that when this is made part of the curriculum, we can do absolutely nothing about it. And I believe that this gender neutrality and these teaching concerning all these things will be the new evolution. You remember when it was taught and brought first in that evolution would be taught in the schools, the world was in an outcry. Nobody kicks up too much about it now. But once it came into the school, you could do nothing about it. And once this filthy teaching, this teaching it is against God's word, enters into the school, we'll be able to do nothing about it. What do you think this teaching on gender neutrality will do to the minds of innocent children? You know how impressionable these minds of these young children are. But sadly, so, is the, so does the ones who, is pushing, who are pushing these things. They know how impressionable their minds are. And you know, I was thinking, brothers and sisters, and as the man who would be shepherding the flock, I have to think about these things. But we had 170 children through the doors two weeks ago in the Holiday Bible Club. What do you think... What sort of children will come through the doors in the next two or three years' time when they start teaching this stuff in schools? And these dear children will need the gospel. They need to hear the gospel. But they could be coming from a family where they have been taught in school that it's all right for there to be a daddy and a daddy. 
And it's all right for there to be a mummy and a mummy. And it's all right for a boy to be a girl and a girl to be a boy. And we'll be walking on thin ice. Will we have to cater for these things? Will we have to change our teaching? What if we don't? All these things are on the horizon. And brothers and sisters, we are on the brink. We're living in momentous days. We are on the brink of the Savior's return. And the church is being described as lukewarm. And you know what gives me more sleepless nights? And you know what takes up more of my prayer life than anything else? It's how to be a good father. How to raise a family in a wicked and sinful world for the glory of God. That's what gives me most bother. And I know I have a great responsibility as a man who would bring the word to you in this assembly. And I will be judged according to that. But my first priority, yes, I want to see souls saved. And yes, I want to see the assembly built up. But my first priority is my family. Friend, what is the most important thing in your life? What is the most important thing that God has entrusted into your care? And it's those little children he's placed into your hands. And I would love to see, especially in a younger generation, family values and family morals once again being given the authority and the attention that they're due. Because whether we like it or not, this is the only thing that will keep some sort of order in this world. Until the Savior comes. And when you look out in the world today, you say to me, what's the first thing that the devil's attacking? Well, it's not necessarily the coming of Christ, the teaching of the rapture. And it's not necessarily the blessing of gathering out unto the name of the Lord and remembering the Savior at every Lord's day. No, it's the family. It's the family concept. And that is what is most under attack today. And let us be men and women who are men and women of the family. If you have children of your own, put everything into them. If you have grandchildren, put everything into them. And seek to see a generation who would rise up to know the Lord. But you know, brothers and sisters, we've only talked about the rights in the world. People's rights in the world. And as we look at this letter, the Lord's letter to Laodicea, he didn't write it to the world, he wrote it to us. And so what is this with regards to people's rights, with the rights of those who are saved in the house of God? Tell me, what rights do you have as a Christian? What rights do you or I have as a Christian in the assembly, in the house of God? Do you want me to tell you? Absolutely none. And this is teaching we don't hear much on today. The unchallenged lordship of Christ over the life of the child of God. We have no rights as a child of God. Because the day and hour we bowed the knee in salvation and took the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We not only took him as our Savior, but we took him as our Lord. And sometimes people will teach, yes, you can accept the Lord Jesus as your Savior, and then maybe two or three years later down the line, you can accept him as your Lord. You'll not find it in the Word of God. As soon as Christ becomes the Savior of one's life, he becomes the Lord of one's life. And the Lordship of Christ is enacted in the life of the believer. Why? Because he has purchased us with the blood of his own. We're no longer our own. The Lord Jesus Christ laid down a price to pay. It was precious blood. And when the Lord Jesus purchased us with that precious blood, and we came into the good of that salvation, we no longer became our own, but we became Christ's. Is that not what the Apostle Paul was teaching the believers in Corinth? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 19 and 20, Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? which ye have of God. Listen. And ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are 
God's. This body is not my own. This body through lordship belongs to him. And I lay in the dust my dreams, my hopes, my plans, my aspirations, everything for this life. And I humbly submit myself to him as a servant of the sovereign Lord. And I say, Lord, you do with me whatever you would see fit. That's lordship. I have no will of my own. I have no mind of my own. I have no life of my own. You bought me with precious blood. I am yours. Whatever you tell me to do, I will do. Whatever you tell me to go, I will go. As long as I am in the center of your absolute mastery and sovereign will. And you know, sadly, as we look through the letter of Laodicea, we find that many believers today have become masters of their own destinies. Captains of their own ships. If we feel like obeying the Lord, we do it. As if we would have the choice. If we feel like obeying the Lord, we do it. And if we don't, the Lord Jesus just gets pushed to the side. And the only things that fix our gaze is the things that take our own fancy. The things that we want to do. But when it comes to faithfulness to the Lord, sadly he becomes second best. And you know, brothers, I think, and sisters as well, I tend to think we have lost what it is to please the Father. I was giving us a bit of thought through the week. We have lost what it is to bring joy to the Father's heart. Do you want to know the wee man's favorite words? Where do you see this, Daddy? Where do you see this, Daddy? And whatever I am doing, no matter what it is, as long as he's not running the key down the side of the car, I will drop everything and go to see the wee man bring pleasure to the Father's heart. Could we put that concept into our lives? To know that God the Father looks down and sees all things. And for us just to have the sincere heart of a little child. And I say this reverently. Just to look up and say, Father, can you see me? Not in a prideful way, but Father, can you see me? I'm in your word. I know it brings, I know it brings joy to your heart. Father, can you see me in the place of prayer? Because I know when I lift my heart in praise to you, it brings pleasure to your heart. I want to love the Lord Jesus more. Why? Because I know it brings pleasure to your heart. And just as the wee sprog there would come in, I'd say, where do you see this, Daddy? He's so happy with what he's done. He wants to bring pleasure to my heart. So too we should take that concept and be, oh Father, see me. Where do you see this, Father? We're in the Word. We're in the place of prayer. And so you can see it's not about our rights. It's about Christ. And sadly today in the church of Jesus Christ, we have become a very complaining people. Oh, well I know these are practical issues, but I'll say them anyway. Oh, the church is too warm. Or oh, the church is too cold. Oh, there's not enough stuff in the assembly for the weans. Oh, there's not enough singing, and there's not enough music, and there's not enough modern hymns. Oh, what about our rights? Christ says, I'm Lord of the assembly. He says, we have no rights. Because when we got saved, we submitted our rights to him. And we would come alongside and draw alongside and align ourselves in with the teaching of God's word. And so it's not about our rights, it's about Christ. And this is why the Lord Jesus approaches the assembly as the amen, as the faithful and true witness, as the beginner of the creation of God. Now what does amen mean? Amen just simply means truly, verily, so be it. The word amen is a universal phrase. It's been taken straight out of the Hebrew and just translated as amen in the Greek. You could go anywhere across the world and everybody will know what amen means. But I don't necessarily want to appoint your attention to what amen means. I want to appoint your attention to where amen comes. Amen always comes at the end. You see, when someone prays or when someone preaches and they close with the words, Amen. 
And all the people who are listening or all the people who are hearing say, Amen. They're making what that man has just said their own. That's why we say amen at the end of a, mess, a meeting or at the end of a prayer. Because if your heart has been touched by what a person has prayed and they say amen, you just say amen. I am in full agreement with what they have just said or what they have just prayed. Now you see why the Lord Jesus addresses himself as the amen. Because when the Lord Jesus addresses himself and being as the amen, he is showing the assembly at Laodicea that he is the end of all things. That he is the final authority. Now are you noticing this? The Lord Jesus didn't introduce himself as the Amen to the first church, Ephesus. He introduced himself as the Amen to the last church, Laodicea. And he is saying to this assembly, the verdict that I am going to pass in your lukewarmness, all that I am going to say concerning who you are as believers in Christ, and what you will read in this letter, I want you to take a step back. I want you to evaluate all that I've said. And I want you to say amen to the verdict that I have passed upon you. Brothers and sisters, could we say amen to all that the Lord Jesus has said? Because when Christ says amen, his verdict is final. When Christ says amen, his verdict cannot be changed. And it's very beautiful the way the Savior does it. Because he not only wants us to say amen to what he's saying to, to Laodicea, but he wants us to say amen to what he's saying to Ephesus, to what he's saying to Smyrna, to what he's saying to Pergamos, to what he's saying to Thyatira, to what he's saying to Sardis, to what he's saying to Philadelphia. That's why he's the amen in the last assembly. That we might say, yes, Lord, we are in full agreement of all that you have said. We are in full agreement with every verdict that you have passed upon the assemblies. And let us forever keep in our minds to ask ourselves what assembly are we, not only collectively but individually. If our love is not what it should be, we've got the answer in Ephesus. If our faithfulness is not what it should be, we've got the answer in Smyrna. If our purity is not what it should be, we've got the answer in Thyatira. If our loyalty is not what it should be, we've got the answer in Pergamos. All the answers are in every assembly. And the Lord wants us to say amen to each and every one. But then the next thing the Lord says is, He is the faithful and true witness. You see, what makes us be able to submit ourselves to the Lordship of Christ? Simply because He is faithful and true. And you know, the Lord Jesus will never exaggerate our condition. The Lord Jesus will never paint us in a different light than the light we are in. He won't always give us what we want. But he will always give us what we need. And in every aspect of life, the Savior will always be faithful and he will always be true. And you that have friends in your life and they might see you going down a wrong path, say nothing about it. But the Lord Jesus won't. If the Lord sees us deviating down a wrong path in life, he will draw alongside us and he'll be faithful. He'll not let us go the way we shouldn't. But then he'll be true. He'll not just whisper a few sweet things in our ears. He'll tell us exactly what we need to hear. And so the reason why we're able to submit to the Lordship of Christ is because he's faithful and because he is true. He's not only faithful to us, but the word witness points his faithfulness to his Father. Because that witness, word witness, is where we get our English word martyr from. And so the Lord Jesus was a true and faithful witness, even on to death. And when you apply the true and faithful witness to Laodicea, we get this. If you think about Laodicea's condition, they had no outward pressures of persecution troubling them. We don't read of them going through persecution. We don't read of them going through trials. Everything is fine and dandy upon the horizon of the Laodicean church. No pressures without. And as we read down through the letter, it would seem that there is no doctrinal issues coming up from within the way it did in some of the other assemblies. So they have no pressures without. 
And they have no pressures within. And what has it brought? Lukewarmness. And the Lord Jesus says, you have no pressures without, you have no pressures within, and still you're lukewarm. You're not being a true and faithful witness to the world. And that is the reason why the Lord is going to have to spew a few people out of his mouth. The word is literally vomit. And we will see that next Lord's Day morning. But then very, very quickly and finally, he says he is the beginner. Not the beginning as the verse says, but the beginner of the creation of God or the originator of the creation of God. Because if you ever get a knock at your door and it's the Russellites, the Jehovah Witnesses, they'll take you to this verse and they'll say, look, the Lord Jesus was the beginning of God's creation. God created the Lord Jesus first. He was the beginning of the creation. And then from the Lord Jesus, everything was made after that. But that's not the word. The word is beginner, the word is originator, and the reason why the Lord Jesus uses this title is because he is lifting this thought straight out of the book of Colossians. Now I want you to turn to the book of Colossians very, very quickly to chapter 4 and verse 16. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 16. Because the letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the Colossians, funnily enough, was also sent to the assembly at Laodicea. So keep that in your mind. Colossians chapter 4 verse 16, and we'll be done in just a few minutes. Paul says, and when this epistle, the epistle of the Colossians is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. The church at Laodicea received the Colossian letter. And the Lord Jesus pointing the assembly at Laodicea to him who is the beginner of creation is pointing their minds back to this letter that they had received. Now if you look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, this would be a phrase or a word that would prick their minds. Verse 15 says, Who is the Lord Jesus? Who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn, the firstborn of every creature. Now again, just as it's not the beginning, he's not the beginning of the creation in, in Revelation 3, he's the beginner. Here this is showing us that he is not the firstborn in the sense that he was again first created. But no, it is pointing us to his preeminent dignity. And as John says in his gospel, chapter 1, without him was not anything made that was made. He is the source. He is the originator of all things. And so this term, firstborn, is pointing to his preeminence. And you get that in verse 18. Look at the end of verse 18. That in all things he might have the preeminence. What does preeminence mean? It's a big word, but what does it mean? It's very simple. Preeminence just simply means to have first place. To hold the first place. So you could read it in that verse. That in all things, he might have the first place. That in all things, he might hold the first place. Now what had happened in Laodicea? You're seeing it, I hope. Christ no longer had first place. He no longer had preeminence. And in taking their minds back as the one who is the beginner of the creation of God, is taking their mind back to this Colossian letter that they had received from the hand of Paul and showing them again the majesty and the might of his power in creation. Who he is. In and of himself, God. And he is showing them that if the Lord Jesus Christ must have first place and had first place in preeminent dignity in the very creation of this world, much more should he have first place in a greater creation, the assembly. And I want you to grasp that. The house of God, the assembly of God, 
the saints in whom Christ died to redeem, is a far greater creation, a far marvelous creation, a far mightier creation than the creation God ever spoke into existence. Why? Because in order to redeem a world of sinners lost, he didn't just speak and it was done. But he spoke the greatest word, word the world ever seen, the word of his son. And he gave all that he had, the very darling of his bosom, to die on an old rugged cross for sinners such as you and me. That is why he comes as the amen. Are you willing to believe all that the Lord has said concerning the assembly? Can you say amen? That is why he comes as a faithful and true witness, because he never flowered up and he never to dim it down. It's faithful and true. And he is the beginner, the originator of all things. And he must have first place in our lives. What will dispel lukewarmness? Again, a right appreciation of who the Savior is. A right appreciation of the glory of God in our lives. And seeking to put the Savior first. I'll close with this little hymn. We'll worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Bow down before him his glory proclaim with gold of obedience and incense of lowliness. Kneel and adore him. The Lord is his name. May the Lord bless his word again for, to our hearts this morning and trust that we'll take these things to heart. And as we finish off this letter next Lord's Day morning, we will see more of the Lord's words to this assembly. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee again for the written Word of God. And we thank Thee, Father, for the truthfulness and the faithfulness of the Savior. We thank Thee, Father, for at times He looks deep into the depth of our souls. And we're challenged, our Father, every time we come to the Word of God. Every time we read about the love of Christ, we would ask ourselves, do I love Him more? Every time we read of the faithfulness of the Savior to us, we would ask ourselves the question, do we reciprocate that faithfulness to Him? Father, you would ask this morning, even as we have just simply looked at these and this threefold description of the Savior, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginner of the God's creation, that, Father, we would put Christ in his rightful place, that he indeed would be the one who is Lord over the assembly, Lord over our lives, that, Father, we would lay our rights in the dust and seek to give Christ first place, for he alone is worthy. Father, bless thy word in the Savior's name. Amen.